excited about being family together, huh? Can we be thankful that we are a family? Now, I realize you've always got the crazy ones in the family, right? Uh, yeah. So sometimes we're unsure about that because I'm like, I don't know. But we are, are definitely trying to draw attention and focus on why family is so important, in, especially in the life of of a believer. And, and today we're going to continue this message series. Last week, uh, Pastor Richard, he kicked off the series uh, and he said that the number one goal of Restoration House is to build a community based on authentic relationships and family values. Everybody appreciates authentic, right? I, I remember as a kid, you know what a cornucopia is? Well, I remember as a kid how, how nice this cornucopia looked on my grandmother's dining room table. And I reached up and I was trying to grab some of the fruit and, and they were like, no, 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 you can't eat that. And I was like, well, why not? They said, because it's not real. It's not authentic. And, you know, it looks good, but it wasn't real. And, and so the truth is sometimes when we come to church, we think we've got to look the part but we aren't going to be authentic and so the challenge we have as believers is to learn how to live an authentic community because authenticity is what we really need not the fake stuff right the fake stuff isn't going to do you any good um, and so that is why that is the number one goal of restoration house is because we want to be authentic in our relationships now, another reason, an important reason for being authentic and being in relationship together is because God said so. God said so. Uh, we know in Psalm 68, he says he sets the solitary in families. And while individuals, we are also members of one another. And, and that's an important principle that we have to recognize. You know, we think we can just slip in and slip out but, but the reality is we need each other. And God knows that. And that is why God has established this principle um, in his word that as believers, we are to be in family. And so uh, we all know that sometimes family, as I said, can be sometimes difficult. Those can be the, the relationships that we don't enjoy or that we avoid, uh, even though they are our relatives. However, um, Paul, he said that uh, our family definition has expanded to include all of God's household. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. So if you are a saint, I love that word. I love when Paul uses that word. And for me, in the faith tradition I grew up in, a saint meant something very specific that I felt was unattainable. But the reality is a saint, by definition in God's word, is someone who is set apart. And if you are a follower of Jesus, the good news is you are a saint. Now, sometimes we're saints who occasionally sin. I get that. But the reality is we have been set apart for a purpose. We have been set apart for a destiny, and we have been put into the family of God as members of his household. And so as members of God's household, it's important for us to look and to learn from the life and the spirit of the earliest church that we have recorded for us in Scripture. And that's what we're going to do today. We'll be... We'll be looking at why being a part of the family of the community of God is not only important for our own individual lives, but also the impact that our unity will have on our community. You know, Pastor Richard was, was talking about it as he was closing worship about the bold things he's believing for in our community. Are, are you tracking that God can do amazing things in our community. This community has seen a lot of hardship that has been brought on by division that the people of God haven't stepped into and done something about. We are not going to be that people, are we, church? Amen. Come on. Save me. 
we are not going to be the people that are just going to stand idly by. We are not going to let Jesus' mandate to go into the world, which includes our neighborhood. Yes, we absolutely can go to Mexico. But you know what? We've got friends. We've got people right here in our community, our, our neighbors, that need Jesus. And we are going to do our part to carry the gospel, to carry the good news, but to be a representation of the gospel and the good news by the way that we live together. And so today is going to be a challenging message because, you know, the truth is the people outside these four walls, they look at what's going on inside these four walls. And so we have to be mindful of the way that we interact with one another. And, and so we're going to look at an example of one of the earliest churches recorded in Scripture for us so that we can learn from them and see how God moved among them as they lived together. So as we talk about God's kingdom, you know, and Jesus, when he came he preached the kingdom of God. He said, the kingdom have, of God has come. And he preached about the kingdom of God for two solid years. Now, what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the restoration of God's rule over all things. Now, the term church family we use this term because it captures the fullness of both the fellowship and the relationship between Christians. But sadly, many Christians today, uh, you know, because they are choosing not to let God's rule be established in their life, they live as orphans. Spiritual orphans. Children of God with no family relationships. Or they're like foster children, bouncing from house to house, never really finding a home. They remain disconnected, refusing to establish roots, and missing out on what God has for us as a healthy member of God's family. And so, when there are children in the world, we know this, when there are children in the world who have been orphaned, what do we do? We try to get them to be a part of suitable families. We're thankful for the many foster families that we even have in our church that try to make a place for children who don't have a family to have the kind of stability that comes with a healthy family. And so we want to see these orphans get into good families. And, and we don't want these children out on their own. Why? Because we understand that children grow best when they are connected to family. If you are disconnecting, uh, disconnected from the church or from the family of God, and, and you might be sitting here today, but you might not be connected. Okay? And, and I really want to challenge us to think about that. You know, to what degree am I willing to be authentic? Am I willing to be connected with my family? And... So because we understand that we grow best as a connected member of the family, we have to understand that we are not to give up on meeting together. And the scripture is pretty plain about that, that we are to be consistent. We are to be intentional. We aren't supposed to be casual about this. And we're going to see, again, in our example of the church we're going to look at today, they were not casual. They were very intentional. And I get it. We're busy. Lives are hectic. Kids have every sport imaginable, and you're running to, to every activity for your, for your kids, and I understand that. But, you know, the truth is we as believers sometimes prioritize community last above everything else. And my goal today is that we are going to evaluate our priorities and say, you know what, I need to reevaluate because I understand that if I want to be a healthy part of God's family, I need to be connected. Because an hour a week attending a church service doesn't accomplish what God needs to accomplish in our lives. It's great that you're here. Thank you for being here. And I'm not minimizing that whatsoever. I'm thankful that I have this opportunity uh, to, to speak about this today. But the truth is, we have lots of opportunities to gather throughout the week and to be connected with one another. And we're going to see why that's important. Okay, 
enough set up. Let's look at our key text for today, which is Acts uh, 2, 47. So go ahead um, and turn there in your scriptures, Acts uh, 2. We're going to go through, I said 47, 42 to 47. Acts 2, 42 to 47. And so go ahead, if you've got your word, uh, turn there uh, and be ready. Uh, I'm going to do a little setup as you're turning in your scriptures and talk about and remind you of what happened just prior to what we're going to read about in our key text today. So prior to our key text in Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4, the scripture says when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place and suddenly a sound like a violent rushing wind came from heaven. And it filled the whole house where they were staying. And they saw tongues like flames of fire. And what, it, what happened? It, it separated and rested on each of them. And then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were educated people and there were also non-educated people who both under the power of the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues that they did not know, right? And the Spirit is what enabled them. And then there's Peter, the, the same guy who just before this happened, he denied Jesus. And now he's filled with power, and he stands before the people explaining the miracle of the Spirit being poured out on those who were in that upper room, who were praying, they were waiting uh, for the Spirit to be poured out. And at the end of Peter's message, the scriptures say that 3,000, 3,000, 3,000. Now, how many people do you think there are in this room? There's probably about 120 to 150 people in here. Can you, envis can you envision 3,000 3,000 people were converted to become followers of Jesus in that one moment. So what do you do? What do you do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do when God begins to send, when people begin, when we go out and we, and we demonstrate what it means to live in God's family, when we demonstrate living in unity together, when we boldly declare the good news of the gospel, when you boldly declare the gospel, right? What are we going to do when the thousands come? We are going to celebrate. Amen. We're going to celebrate. But think about this. How do you help 3,000 new converts flourish and grow in their new faith. Do, do we build a new building when that happens? Do you hire more staff? Well, that's what the church answer would be if 3,000 converts were added to any local church. However, as we examine our key text, we will see and have some insight into what the early church did in response to this great move of God. All right, so let's read our key text together, which is Acts Chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. The scripture says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many signs and wonders were being performed through the apostles. Now, all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions, their property, and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day, I love this, every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Man, yeah, that's right. Amen. Can we celebrate? I mean, really, isn't that a beautiful picture? I love when I love this passage. And so when when Pastor Richard was preparing our series and and I saw that I got to preach on this text, I was like, oh man. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, I only have 30 minutes, but man, I could talk for hours about this because honestly, when 
I look at the church today, this is not what I see. This is what I long for. This is what I pray for when I consider how the church is to be. And, and I believe that that's who we are going to be. And that we are going to encourage others to be. And we're going to, we're going to uh, just glorify God. And, and He is going to get praise in this city. Amen? Amen? It's not because of who we are. It's because of who He is. Right? And so we're going to look at this church as a model church. And while this church can be considered a model church, we know it was far from perfect. Guess what? There were hypocrites. They probably had doctrinal issues, disagreements. And at the end of the day, they were sinful people, <laughs> right? Um, you, you, you put any two people in a room, I don't care who you are, <laughs> and, you know, we can find... We, we can easily find things to disagree about, right? If it, 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 it just, the way things happen naturally with us, which is why we need Jesus. Um, so, so we know they weren't perfect. Yet, despite uh, the familiar shortcomings of this church, we see how this large inner city church in Jerusalem developed and functioned after Pentecost. So let's break down what happened to give us some perspective. Okay, Again, 120 started out in the room. They were tarrying there. They were waiting there. They were, they were anxiously awaiting the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit was poured out on them, and then 3,000 were added. The church had less than 20 leaders, but we will see that all of those who followed Jesus, not just the leaders, were doing the work of the ministry. Incidentally, this is exactly how Paul said the church should work in Ephesians chapter 4. The scripture says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. What for? To equip. To equip the saints. There's that word again. Who are the saints? You are to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ until we attain the knowledge of God's Son growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. And so as we examine this first century church, my challenge for you today is to ask in what ways can and should I be investing beyond what I'm doing today? Because the reality is God is just looking for a people who are prepared. God is looking for a people who are expecting. That's what I love about Pastor Richard's uh, admonition to us today is, are we expecting? We, you know, we honestly, we can't be expecting if we aren't willing to do our part. And, and so let's look at what our part looks like. And I pray that as you are sitting there and hopefully you're making notes and you're, you're looking at your scriptures and you're highlighting things and, and maybe God is speaking to you specific things. Man, I pray that you don't just sit there idly and blow that off. I know it's easy. We're distracted by our phones dinging and things like that. And, oh, what was, you know, there's, there's lots of things to distract us right now. And I just want us to zero in on some key things that we can learn from this church that had 3,000 added to their number. What did they do? How were they prepared? What are we going to do? How will we be prepared? You have a part. You have a part. And I need you to believe that. Because if you call Restoration House home, you are part of this family. We need you. Okay, Jesus, he prayed. He prayed a powerful prayer, and Jesus' prayer, do you believe Jesus' prayer get answered? Yes. I believe it, that his prayers get answered. And, you know, the truth is, he's, he's praying for us here. In John 17, he says, he's asking God that they, all of them, may be one. All of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am you, and you, 
may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Do you see how powerful that is? When we act as one, you know, it doesn't mean we're always going to agree. But when we are acting together as God's household, as God's family, it testifies to the world. You know, that's really the problem, you know, that many will say they have with the church is they don't see us living the things Jesus was praying for us about. And there is a testimony in that as well. But we want to be a people who are going to represent the heart of God and draw men right through our love for one another and be an answer to Jesus prayer okay so let's jump in and look at the first characteristic of this church that they were learning and then they were studying okay as we read the opening verse of our text Acts 2 42 it said they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching they were focused on learning and with so many new followers of Jesus they were focused on growing that them What do we call that? What what do you call that when you have somebody new and you're teaching them to follow Jesus? Oh, yeah, it's called discipleship. So we see it right out of the gate, okay? They are focused on discipleship. They are focused on the Word. They are focused on the apostles' teaching. So having just been through the experience of Pentecost, however, and I'm pointing this out because I want to... I want to make a connection here that I think you guys can uh, see. Um, Had we gone through Pentecost, right, it would have been very easy to focus on that experience and what it had been, living uh, or or focused on that moment in the past, right? Could you imagine if we had a Pentecost moment where where flames were above each other's heads and, and we were speaking in different languages. Man, we, we would do everything we could to promote that on social media. Look at what's happening here. And we would be so focused on, on what happened that we aren't in the past, that we aren't focused on what we need to be doing going forward. They weren't reveling. We don't read in the scripture and the testimony of this church that they were reveling in their past experience. Instead, they reveled in the word of God. They reveled in the word of God. This is always the the first mark of a spirit-filled church, of which we are. We are a spirit-filled church, and this is the first mark of a spirit-filled church. Anybody beside Pastor Richard agree with that, that we need to be students of the word. We can say amen and celebrate that. Here's the thing. I know why you wrestle with this, because you're like, oh, man. I get it. Sometimes being a student of the word, you think you have to be some theological doctorate, right? And no Greek and all that kind of stuff. Sure, those things are helpful, you know, but, but the truth is we, we study God's word not because we want to be intellectuals, but because we want to understand the heart of God. He gave us his word so we can understand his heart. And through his word, he transforms us. They knew that. They knew that the transforming power of the gospel is what would bring the change in these 3,000 new converts' life, right? And so they, they majored on this one thing, which is knowing God's word. They were a learning, studying church focused on discipleship. Now, the apostles were the ones who were specifically chosen by Jesus to remember and to teach and to authentically record all of his earthly uh, ministry. And and this is what they were devoted to learning. And so a spirit-filled church is always going to be a Bible-studying church, right? Um, And and that's that's just who we need to be. The Scripture, the Scripture is truth it's our plumb line for any and all human experience it's for testing everything that we encounter in life this this is our plumb line do you know what a plumb line is any builders in the house a plumb line is what helps you know whether something is square or true right a couple weeks ago when i preached my message on the leaning and i used as an example the leaning tower of pisa you know that whoa it was it was leaning 15 feet 
to one side because it wasn't square, it wasn't plumb, it wasn't true. So, I got a question for you. Are you in the Word? Are you studying the Bible? Are you growing in your knowledge and your understanding and your application? Most importantly, your application of God's Word. Uh, this is one of the things that I love about Trail Life, a wonderful ministry that I will put a shameless plug for uh, here in the middle of my message and what we teach and impart our young boys as part of our local troop. Every troop meeting during the opening ceremony, were are any trailmen in the house today? Okay, there they are, a couple of them in the back serving because, man, these young men are faithful, right? But we have a pledge that we recite at the beginning of every time we gather as a troop. It says, I pledge, and I've got it here up on the screen for you, I pledge allegiance to the Bible. Say it with me. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, and I will hide its words in my heart so that I might not sin against God. Amen. You know what else is happening at our age to encourage life together and in the Word? You know what else is happening? We are launching life groups this week. And there are plenty of opportunities to grow together and study the Bible together. Yes, amen. So Pastor Mike, I think, has got for me, um, I didn't have this in my slide, but we have got lots of opportunities for you. And so you can go to the RH app right now, and I, it's okay. I encourage you to do that. And, and we've got groups, and you, you don't have to just be part of one. You can be more than one if you sh should choose. And we have many of you who have already done that, have signed up for more than one. But we have groups for men specifically. We have groups for women specifically, focused on issues that that either men or women would deal with. We have different topics as it relates to families. And if you're a life group leader, uh, our life group leaders should be wearing badges here. Can I just invite you guys to stand for me? Because I want the people to see where you're at. Here's the thing. We want to get you connected into a group. And so we have been intentional to wear these little lanyards, okay? Uh, and Donna, she's in the back back there in the door. She's on the hospitality team. She wants you to know she's a life group leader as well. All right. Uh, we got Pastor Jackie back here. Um, and we've got Brother Gerald and Sister Diana. We've got folks all over this auditorium who would love to tell you about the things they are doing to, in their life group, when they meet, where they meet, what the topic is. And so you have plenty of opportunity to get in and spend time together in the word. I'm going to make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path so that I will hide his words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Will you join me in that? So I'm okay if you take a few minutes. If you haven't signed up yet, and I know you're out there because I'm watching very closely. <laughs> All right? And we, we aren't doing this because we want you to feel guilty. We're doing this because we know it brings life. It brings life. Thank you, Life Group leaders. Thank you for uh, graciously standing for me. So please find somebody afterwards. And when we're doing our social um, uh, for the one-way students, find out about what's going to be happening in these life groups. Look at, um, look at these different opportunities and get yourself connected, okay? W will you do that for me? And will you faithfully attend? Don't just sign up. Show up. You know, we're, we're guilty of that in this culture today. We sign up for lots of things, but then we have no follow-through. Man, let's, let's be the people of God. Let's, let's honor God by being people of our word. If you sign up, show up. I get it. Things happen. You, you have things come up. But let's, let's be faithful uh, to uh, spend time together in life and community together. All right. And so if you're born of the Spirit... You will be drawn to this book. Okay? You will be drawn to this book because there are life. There's life in these pages. I know when you get to reading genealogies, you think it's dry as dust. But I promise you there's even a reason that, that those are there. 
they testify to the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And so I'm going to be pretty direct. Not that you wouldn't expect me not to be. Um, My heart is not to be critical, but this is set out of my love for you. But if you've been born again and you don't want to study the Bible, or you say it seems boring, or it has not really done much for me, then I'd ask you to examine yourself very carefully. I have found the, the words of Proverbs 2 to be very true in my life, and I'd like to draw your attention to the use of the word if in Proverbs chapter 2. My son or daughter... If you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, meaning you want to understand, you lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver, and this is wisdom, and search for her as hidden treasure, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, for from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And so I'd encourage you to be committed to study the word on your own. But, but let's do this together in community by joining a life group. Now, there are others in this church, and I'm thankful for them, that love to teach. I know not everybody is called to teach, right? We read in Ephesians chapter 4, some are called to be apostles, some prophets, some pastors, some evangelists, some teachers. Not everybody is called to do that, but, the, but praise God, we have some wonderful teachers in this house that love the Word of God. And so, you know, we can get together and we can explore and learn and grow and celebrate the goodness of what God is doing together um, in these life groups. And so... Uh, here, here's the thing. They, they love to teach you how to fish so that you can discover on your own and then teach others to do the same. Because the reality is all of us need to know how to dig into God's word. I remember when I first became a believer, I didn't know the difference between the New Testament and the Old Testament. I had no idea. I had, some, I had a, a, a roommate of mine in college call me out on it. It was okay. I appreciated the challenge. Now, I didn't appreciate his style so much. I'm not going to do that with others. I'll, I'll do so in a loving way. But, you know, the truth is I, I appreciated his willingness to help me understand, you know, why is the Bible laid out the way it is? And what, what, what can I learn from the Old Testament? What, what is in the New Testament? What is this about? And so we can learn to follow Jesus together in life groups. And then as we learn to follow Jesus, we in turn can teach others to follow Jesus as we have been learning. And uh, it's a beautiful process that Jesus set up for us. Okay, so first, they were devoted to the Word. They were devoted to Bible study. Second, they were devoted to fellowship. Not only were those at the church in Jerusalem devoted to the Bible, but also to gathering together. Bible scholar John Stott, he said the word fellowship was born at the day of Pentecost. This is because Christian fellowship means that we have common participation in God, which is what had drawn the Christians of that time together. And so we read about that. Uh, The apostle John, he said in 1 John 1, 3, he says, what we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that you may also have fellowship with us as indeed our fellowship is is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Now, many of you know that the word for fellowship is koinonia, which has its meaning to do with holding something in common. No, no, the fellowship of those in the church in Jerusalem, they had a common fellowship among one another uh, because the spiritual realities they experienced together and the fellowship that they had in the Father and in the Son. Now, fellowship with God and true fellowship with others, these things go hand in hand, okay? This is why we have the corporate gatherings. You know, fellowship with God, we, we commune with God, but then we fellowship with one another. But this is also why we meet from house to house and in gathering throughout the week and not just on once a week on Sundays. You know, it's been said that there's a strong correlation where the stronger your vertical relationship with God is, this increases the probability of your horizontal relationships being stronger. Okay? And so, however, the opposite is also true. If you are not in fellowship with God, you will begin to find yourself adrift. Okay? And you will find yourself out of fellowship 
with other believers. But if you come close to God, you will be drawn to fellowship with other believers. And so this is why personal prayer and private prayer and in the time in the Word is so important, okay? Because there, there's an overflow to that. And so it works the other way as well. If you spend time with Christians, that fellowship will help you draw closer to the Father. Honestly, when I was a new believer, the first thing I did was I got connected. I got connected to a life group. I did. And when I got connected, that fueled my faith. Spending time with other believers fueled my hunger for God's word. It fueled my desire to know God. Okay, and so that's why this is so important. We aren't doing life groups just to create busyness on your calendar. We are trying to be intentional about living a life that is intentional for God and growing in our faith as we learn to follow Jesus and express his heart to a hurting and broken world. Okay. But these relationships we've been talking about up to this point are inward. Okay, they're focused on self. Koinonia is based on the idea of having all things in common, participating in something together, um, or sharing, okay? But if we're honest, our nature is that we would rather keep things to ourselves. I like my group the way it is. I don't want anybody coming into my group. You know, I encourage you, have an empty chair when you meet. Pray for that empty chair, that it would be filled. And that you would be the one to invite someone to be a part of this community life. Okay? Koinonia has a variant closely related to it. It's called koinon ikos, And it means generous. So those who share in God, so koinonia is sharing in God. But we also have this same root word has a meaning that speaks about generosity. And that's God's nature. God is very generous. His nature is, by definition, love and generosity. And we are to be generous with those around them. Let's examine Acts 22, 44, and 45. It says, Now all the believers were together and held all things in common, and they sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Now what we see here is a willingness to give out of a generous heart. That's all we see here. There isn't some mandate that happened where people were told to do this. No, this was an overflow of what God was doing. When, when you understand the gospel that God gave his son, when you understand that God has addressed the malady of every person in this room, when you, when you understand the generosity of what God did to solve that problem, that you and I were going to spend eternity apart from God, and we see the great generosity of God, our heart should be compelled to be generous so that others would know that as well. Amen? Right? The problem is we're stingy or we're, we make excuses. I don't want to do that. That's not my place. That's Pastor Richard's job. He's the bold one. Right? Some of y'all are saying that. I know it. Hey, the truth is we, we don't necessarily have to be bold and, uh, you know, up on stage. We can be bold and in the checkout line at Walmart. and demonstrate the generosity of God's heart. And so we want to take on his nature. We want to be changed to be like him. And, and so Jesus has warnings and admonitions for us all throughout Scripture on this specific heart issue. Um, we can be focused on greed, um, which is where every one of our hearts naturally goes, right? Right? I mean, honestly, we get something. You don't have to teach your kids to go, mine! <laughs> right? They come out that way, don't they? <laughs> you didn't have a class to teach them how to do that. Right. You know, where does that come from? That comes from our nature. And so that's why we need Jesus, because we have to be renewed every day. Because we, we're taking on as saints who occasionally sin the nature of God being transformed by the gospel to have a heart that's overflowing with generosity. But let's, let's look at 
what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12. He said, he told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. And also we see in Acts 20, 35 that Jesus taught it's more blessed to give than receive. We see, I could go on and on about this, but we see this all throughout Scripture. The standard set before us is a standard not of being served, but of serving. Not of receiving, but of giving. How do we do that? Well, we have to be in community together. We have to be intentional together. We have to, we have to love one another. And so our obligation is to use what we have for others. So that is what the early church did. This is one measure of the Christian maturity um, as we see people become more like Jesus. Another characteristic that we see is closely related to the principle of living generos- generously, and it's also evangelizing. Okay? The early church was a missional church. In Acts 2.47, uh, the scriptures say they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. And so they were intentional about going out and sharing the good news of Jesus. And those who had experienced the ministry of God's son, they were also, when, when Jesus was arrested, they were present when Jesus was arrested, they were present when he was tried, and they were present when he was put to death. Some were there when he died on the cross. And some were even witnesses of his resurrection. Jesus' death was God's plan to restore man unto God. And it's a life-transforming message that has to be shared. It has to be shared. That is our responsibility. When we share the gospel, God miraculously works through us despite our imperfections. If we don't do the work of going as we were commanded, nothing will happen. If we do not pray, nothing will happen. But when we pray and when we go, this is how God operates, right? The church, God's family is his plan A and there is no plan B. You are it. The church is God's hope for the world and I'm looking at them. That's you. You look beautiful this morning. All right, Mike, you can come play. The final characteristic we see in this first century church in Jerusalem was worship. They were a worshiping church. Again, we read that they were devoted to breaking bread and to prayer together. Uh, They did this in public places, but then also from house to house, right? Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple, broke bread from house to house is what we see in the scripture here. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. Now, some say breaking bread is the Lord's Supper, which Jesus commanded us to celebrate together, or it can be just what it simply says here, and that they had a meal together. But it seems that they were together quite often, if not every day. And this dynamic has to be intentional. And that's why we create life groups. That's why we have these intentional times to get together, to be connected, okay? Our love for one another can grow. It can only grow as we allow our heart to be transformed by the love of God, which flows out of our worship for God. I want you to see something really important here. We can't do these things and be these things if we don't first give ourselves to worship. Worship is such an important part of the believer's life. Unfortunately, we reserve it to just moments like this on Sunday. Right? But we can see here that the people of God gave themselves to worship. Why? Because first of all, we understand that my heart has to be changed to worship. You know, the, tr- the truth is, and Pastor Richard was even admonishing us to be expressive. I get it. It's hard. You know, we'll, we'll paint ourselves blue and purple and whatever color we want and go to a football game and scream like mad people, right? For a football team or a basketball team. I mean, give me a break, right? I get it. It's fun. I enjoy sports, so I'm not knocking that at all. I I love cheering on my team, even though the Chicago Bears lose all the time. (laughs) But the truth is, when it comes to God, when it comes to our worship, where is your heart? Let me get personal. When you worship, 
when you worship. It's an overflow of the love that you have for God. Does your love for sports teams, does your demonstration of your love for sports team exceed your demonstration of your love for God? And again, I'm not picking on that. I, I, I love going and having a fun time with friends. I've done it myself. So I'm not knocking that. But I, what, I, what I know we wrestle with within the body is our expression, our desire to come to the Father and to let Him transform us. Does worship transform your heart? You know, I, I had a random thing show up in one of my feeds this week that really struck me because, first of all, I remembered this moment in history, but then I began to ponder over this because this was, this was a, a social media post that I saw that wasn't posted by somebody of faith. This was posted as someone who made an observation about God's great love transforming somebody's heart. Back in 1981, um, Pope John Paul um, was shot four times in the abdomen during a parade uh, in St. Uh, Peter's Square in Vatican City. Despite being critically wounded, the Pope recovered and he forgave his attacker. And, and I remember this moment, and this picture just struck me. This picture just struck me because he forgave his attacker. And after visiting his attacker in jail, he said, pray for my brother. He admonished the church to pray for my brother who I have sincerely forgiven. And then in 2000, his attacker was pardoned by the president and John Paul from Christ. And then this attacker converted to Christianity as a result of the great love and forgiveness that was shown to him. So now consider your life. When, not if, when you find yourself in a situation where you have the choice to love your enemy. That person who offended you or hurt you may be sitting somewhere in this room. Many of us might say with scorn and disdain over my dead body. I'll never forgive him. I pray this is never the response out of the heart or the mouth of anyone who professes to follow Christ. If it is what you wrestle with, I suggest that you up your game in the area of worship. True worship is valuing and treasuring God above all things. When we value or treasure God above all things, that is what Jesus came to establish, the restoration of God's rule over all things. But guess where that starts? It starts right here in our heart. Right? When we value God and allow his word to rule over our desires, right? That we might not sin against God. It transforms your heart just like it did John Paul. And I'm, I'm, I know you say he's the Pope. He's supposed to do that. Hey, guess what? I appreciate the fact that a leader was willing to demonstrate, right? He was setting the example. He was doing what we should all be doing. out of a transformed heart. I mean, this was somebody who intended to kill him and literally tried, shot him four times in the abdomen. Would you have that kind of forgiveness for someone attacking you like that? I pray we would. But worship is the key to that. It starts there. So let's sum up what marks the spirit-filled community. First, they were eager to study the word and believe and obey what Jesus had taught his apostles. They related to one another in fellowship and in love, having all things in common. They were intentional to get together regularly. They were mission-minded. They weren't just focused on themselves. They were focused outwardly, sharing the good news, the gospel. And then 
they related to God in worship and allowed him to transform their hearts. Now, many of you might know the songwriter and artist Cody Carnes. He writes and performs many songs, and his wife is pretty well known. Also, Carrie Job, um, she sings a song or two. Uh, but Cody wrote a song called Run to the Father. In it are these words. He knows our condition and had a plan from the start. His son for our redemption. Let's let God deal with us.